Something changed inside of me. I woke up. I no longer saw the world as I used to. I quit my job, I sold my stuff, I've downsized my entire life. I've been living off my savings for a few years now. I no longer see a point in participating in the real, fake world. I know that everything I see is a lie, everything I've ever known is a lie. My whole world has been nothing but one giant lie from the start, and I can see that clearly now. So why bother? Anonymous message on voat.com forum. The Matrix has attacked me. On the one hand, the ideas around being red-pilled are farcical. The Red Pill is a very interesting documentary wherein a feminist went out to <laughs> make fun of these stupid men's rights losers. They're racists, basically. Either meant as a derisive, throwaway pop culture meme, or because of that very fact, a symbol of the decline of public discourse. The QAnon movement has picked up tens of thousands of followers and some celebrity endorsements. But I think any language adopted so widely can tell us something, maybe even a lot, about that very public discourse. Understood properly, it might reveal insights about why it's so appealing in the first place and how sensible-minded people might respond. What does it mean to take the red pill? Roughly, by discovering the correct knowledge about the world, you can see the truth for what it is, become clear-eyed, authentic. It means having a revelation, realising the difficult truth that we've been indoctrinated and duped by Jewish cabals, sinister globalists, cultural Marxists or radical feminists. The sidebar of the red-pilled subreddit tells us that it's a difficult pill to swallow, understanding that everything you were led to believe is a lie, but once you learn it, internalise it and start living your new life, it gets better. In short, it means something's deeply wrong with society. Caleb Madison writes in The Atlantic that the Matrix became shorthand for the uncanny feeling that our media-saturated, hyper-commercialised, machine-mediated culture had alienated us from some primal human reality. But lots of people believe that there's something wrong with society, and lots of people blame lots of different groups. So why has the idea of the red pill resonated so much with a certain type of person? I need constant chaos. Why do people life. like Andrew Tate and Logan Paul think it's a reliable reference to call upon when they get in some kind of trouble? Being red pilled goes several ways. It can go to the subreddit RTRP, uh, the red pill, which argues that evolutionary psychology can give discontented young men the answers they need to respond to feminism. But it might also lead to believing that a global paedophile ring is being operated from a pizza restaurant in Washington. And it can also lead to one of the original Gamergators, Seattle for Truth, murdering his own father. But whichever direction the rabbit hole goes down, it always seems to go to the right. So before seeing just how far that rabbit hole goes, I want to look at the relationship between being red-pilled and the wider worldviews, ideologies or conspiracies that the red pill offers release from. Because many believe in an inauthentic, manipulated, or just faulty social structure. Many think our institutions need reforming, or our cultural values determine what we think ideologically, or that schooling, or advertising, or capitalism in general indoctrinates us, moulds how we think in some way. So what sets the red pill apart? I want to look at how we might think about the social structures and belief systems that influence all of us, ask if there's any possibility of transcending them, overcoming them, taking that red pill and living authentically. How can we know what the truth is? First, what is the matrix that the red pill seeks to free us from? 
In his book Red Pill Blue Pill, David Newert describes a conspiracy theory as, quote, a hypothetical explanation of historical or ongoing news events comprised of secret plots, usually of a nefarious nature, whose existence may or may not be factual. There are those who have seen through the conspiracy, then there are the rest, us drones, sheep, dupes and fools. The problem, as Newark points out, is that some conspiracies turn out to be very real. People do conspire, secretive plots do exist, the powerful do organise. How then do we distinguish between a conspiracy and a theory? Newart says that real conspiracies have three limitations. They're often small in scope, they aim to achieve one or two ends, they're often short in time frame, and they often involve a limited number of participants. Watergate, for example, had a single goal over a short period, and very few people knew about it. Contrary to this, conspiracy theories often hypothesise a grand plot involving thousands of people to manipulate large numbers of people over a long period of history. Modern conspiracies, Russell Murhead and Nancy Rosenblum also argue, seem to be thrown together from a spurious range of facts. They write, There is no punctilious demand for proofs, no exhaustive amassing of evidence, no dots revealed to form a pattern, no close examination of the operators plotting in the shadows. The new conspiracism dispenses with the burden of explanation. Instead, we have innuendo and verbal gesture. A lot of people are saying that. So what's the logic of the red pill? Is the matrix it's meant to escape from a conspiracy? Let's take a look at the manosphere. The Manosphere is a loose collection of online spaces usually responding in some way to feminism, with views that range from mild to misogynistic. It contains groups like men's rights activists, men going their own way, and pickup artist communities. It's also the source of the red pill metaphor, and where you most frequently find it. Much of it is based on what some have called hegemonic masculinity, that men are, or should be, naturally dominant in society. Feminism, they say, has challenged this. On this view, there's a constellation of institutions, cultural beliefs, societal norms that includes public figures, films and literature that creates a belief system that imposes itself on men's subjectivities, convincing them that the patriarchy has been oppressing women. Men internalise this false belief. The red pill truth is that male dominance is actually natural, either in certain contexts or outright. This is the true self that you can access. At its most extreme, this is the result of a feminist conspiracy, or, according to the red pilled subreddit, of a new female reproductive strategy. The red pilled subreddit says, all of us have been taught how women have supposedly been oppressed throughout human existence. In reality, this narrative is entirely fabricated. It continues, We have arrived at a society where feminists feel that they are empowered, independent and confident, despite being heavily dependent on taxes paid mostly by men, an unconstitutional shadow state that extracts alimony and child support from men. And it continues, Men aren't born with these values, they're drummed into us from the cradle on by society, culture, our families, and most definitely by the women in our lives. Sorry, but that includes you too, Mum. Taking the red pill is to acknowledge this uncomfortable truth. Everything you've been taught is a lie, and it functions as a kind of triad. A dominant matrix of beliefs, for example radical feminism, suppresses and denies my authentic individuality, which takes the form of, say, masculinity, and taking the red pill is a root, a mode of knowledge that can help recover or find that authentic experience. This matrix framework comes up again and again in the history of philosophy. In ancient Greece, 
Plato framed it as a cave in which prisoners have been chained to a wall for their entire lives, seeing the shadow of things happening outside the cave on the wall in front of them. The philosopher, according to Socrates, can escape the cave and see the world for what it really is. Similarly, in the 17th century, Descartes asked how we could be sure what was true. How did he know that an evil demon wasn't deceiving him through his senses, distorting reality for him? How could he be sure that he wasn't dreaming? His answer was that he couldn't be sure of those things, but that even if there was an evil demon, or even if he was dreaming, there had to be a thinking thing to trick for that to be true in the first place. His thought then was what was true, what was real. Rationality was the path to truth. More recently, philosophers have framed it as a brain in a vat question. How can we know that we're not, like in the matrix, brains in vats with an exterior simulation hooked up to our nerve endings? What all of these thought experiments have in common is this dyadic structure of inauthentic versus authentic existence. And they all posit a question. How would you know what's true and what's not? They were formulating ways of thinking about the idea that the outside, exterior, objective world was mysterious, difficult to get to, that we might be being duped by something or someone. And they all have different versions of what truth, or in some cases, authenticity, is. Another philosopher of the Enlightenment, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, took Descartes' idea, but went much further. He argued that whether the exterior world is accessible, essentially whether we're being tricked or deceived or have faulty senses, doesn't really matter. And the reason we don't know is because we create our own experience ourselves. We are the centre of our own universes. That input data we get from the senses doesn't actually come from without, but is produced by our actions, by the moving of our eyes, by our decision to listen or write or do or explore. Man isn't the measure of all things. Man is the maker of all things. He was following Immanuel Kant, who made the case that it isn't the matrix feeding us our experiences, but that we played an active role in coding our own experiences from the raw material that was fed to us from the outside world, what Kant called the thing in itself. Kant made a radical leap that emphasised the importance of the individual, that our world is what we make of it. He said, for example, that in picking up an object, we construct our own knowledge of it. It's not given to us. I'm coding in data from my experience about the sides of the object as I'm turning it, the colour as it shines in the light, and other knowledge I might have of it from elsewhere. He argued that the experience I have of basic objects, and so everything, is deeply personal. Victor took Kant's thought and ran with it. He told his students to look within, to have faith in themselves and their own worldviews and thoughts. This sounds commonplace to us today, but in Victor's time it was radical. He said that if we construct the objective world out there ourselves, then every action, every interpretation, every choice we make is imbued with a kind of absolute freedom. We are at the centre of our own universe. We are free from any matrix. He said things like, the eye posits itself absolutely. He called it self-activity. The eye generates its own experiences. It's not in a cave or a brain in a vat. It creates the cave. It creates the vat. Victor was much more influential in popular culture than he's given credit for now. At the time, admirers from across Europe flocked to see him lecture his radical theories. This was the age of revolution, of freedom, of Napoleon, of romanticism. 
He told his students to, quote, attend to yourself, turn your eye away from all that surrounds you and in towards your inner self. Such is the first demand that philosophy imposes upon the student. We speak of nothing that's outside of you, but solely of yourself. The philosopher Rudiger Safransky writes that Victor wanted to spread among his listeners the desire to be an I. Not a complacent, sentimental, passive eye, however, but one that was dynamic, world-grounding, world-creating. It was a period deeply influenced by Rousseau's assertion that myself alone, I know the feelings of my heart and I know mankind. I am not made like any others I have seen. And Fichter said, echoing Napoleon's campaigns across Europe, that my will alone shall float audaciously and boldly over the wreckage of the universe. Fichter was one of the first thinkers to posit something as truly central, the ego. And if you could find what was the core, what was at the centre of that ego, you could have something else that other philosophers later talked about. Authenticity. Later, in the early 20th century, Martin Heidegger argued that we could escape the everyday ordinariness of the they, the dull averageness of the other, and live a uniquely authentic experience. Jean-Paul Sartre, following him, argued that we are always radically free to transform ourselves, that our existence precedes our essence. We are what we make of ourselves. Society tells us that we should be a certain way, fulfil a certain role, but authenticity means acknowledging that we can always transcend those roles, the expectations, limits and beliefs of the society that surrounds us. If we think in terms of an onion, all of these philosophers, in different ways, believe in an unmediated core at the centre. Jacob Gollum writes that the concept of authenticity is a protest against the blind mechanical acceptance of an externally imposed code of values. What all of these thinkers have in common, and have in common in many ways with red pill philosophy, is that the root to authenticity is present within us, able to be accessed by all at all times, regardless of the ways we've been subjectified, ideologized, molded and shaped by the world we find ourselves thrown into. With the right tools and knowledge, we can see through and overcome and transcend those codes of values that society has imprinted upon us. If this matrix triad, an exterior realm of dominant beliefs, an authentic individual to be uncovered like an onion and a root to getting there, is so common in philosophy, and we see it in today's political discourse, what can that discourse teach us about philosophy? And what can philosophy teach us about that discourse? The Reddit subreddit RTRP, R the Red Pill, describes itself as the Red Pill, discussion of sexual strategy in a culture increasingly lacking a positive identity for men. It's been quarantined, so you can no longer see how many members it has, but its ethos revolves around improving men's health, wealth, confidence and worth and so on, as to hold what they call a higher frame to attract women. The posts range from the mild to the offensive, the personal to the political, but what we're interested in here is that relationship between the inauthentic matrix the authentic experience and the taking of the red pill to get there. In the red pill subreddit, the inauthentic matrix is the new feminist frame we live under. The authentic man has access to some timeless truths about attracting women. The red pill is the way to get there. One post reads, the man of value, instead, brings wisdom, strength, mental fortitude, leadership, wealth and excitement to the table. Women, girls, crave this. It's built into their evolutionary psychology and biology. It is so hardwired into them 
that not even all the movies, TV shows, media propaganda and fiction books can overcome this instinct. Another said, we are indeed no longer in hunter-gatherer times, however, much of what was at play then still applies today. This includes women of course desiring bigger and more physically intimidating men, among many other things. It's all evolutionary behaviour, bro. For the red-pilled, femininity and masculinity are fixed, unchanging and stereotypical. One recent post tells us that most women are naturally hysterics and followers and don't have desires of their own because they base their desires on the desire of the other. The red-pilled sidebar recommends to work on your frame, the way you present yourself, by working on some timeless truths. Most of those truths are innocuous, work out, eat right, dress well, but deep in the how-to guides of the sidebar, you find advice like, contrary to feminist sloganeering, no doesn't always mean no. Oftentimes, no simply means not yet. There are also critiques of feminism like, there's a tendency of media and culture to put women first, excuse their misdeeds, and criticise any holding of accountability or pointing out of double standards as being anti-women. There's much to wade through here, but what I find interesting about the Red Pill subreddit is the way that any man can draw on almost immediately accessible timeless truths about what masculinity is and what women find attractive. This is why being Red Pilled leans conservative. In much of conservative philosophy, wisdom comes from passed down tradition. Everything we need is available from that tradition in the present moment. The best of all possible worlds is here. It aligns with other ideas that conservatives tend to adopt, like rational actor theory and the invisible hand of the market, that the market and rational individuals and sexual selection are all self-balancing, a naturalised order. Of course, if that self-balancing way of the world is natural, then any feminist, leftist, interventionist or regulatory attempts to adjust, correct or aid or change becomes inauthentic, tipping the natural balance off and forcing people into an inauthentic matrix that skews the real self. The wider manosphere all draws from this basic frame. It's why the Red Pill Redditors are often attracted to Andrew Tate, why Andrew Tate supporters align with Jordan Peterson often, and why Peterson fans don't have to do much intellectual legwork to agree that the swamp of the Matrix in Washington needs draining a la Trump. For all of them, climate change discourse is an attempt to control us, as COVID-19 lockdowns were. Government officials are mini-tyrants, feminists are indoctrinated cultural Marxists, the universities are lost to all of them, and so on. It's hard because women have to want to work for you. Okay. Women have to want to obey you. Tate, like Peterson, says he takes on full responsibility for everything that happens to him. Once you're on your own, you really should not be expecting you know, you're, you're swinging on a trapeze. Like this introductory video from the Red Pill Reddit says, you're on your own. For authentic, timeless, inner truth to be accessible, it has to be so without much or any influence from outside. Individual responsibility has to be just that, individual. This mode of conservatism seeks wisdom in the present moment, in the present self, rather than in institutions or universities, say, or political solutions or wider critiques. Advice like build muscle, make your bed, work on your frame is timeless, universal, requires no depth of thought. The Matrix frame has to rely on authentic, natural, eternal truths that are immediately accessible because any other appeal to any other authority is tainted by the Matrix. I, I talked a lot about already about the necessity of cleaning your room, which is, you know, uh, 
Salvation is found, in Jordan Peterson's words, within. This lines up neatly with wider paleoconservative views. Paleo, meaning ancient, conjures up images of a timeless experience we can all access through the nation. National identity is natural. Christian ethics eternally true. Capitalism, the way of the universe. Paternalism, passed down for generations. Paleo thinking relies on the idea of a natural state of nature where everything hangs neatly together. The past should be repeated authentically in the present without change. It's the sacred worship of the present moment. Within this frame, desires, needs, base impulses, especially masculine ones, are taken as natural and to be fulfilled, fitting neatly with consumer culture too. Every cultural and consumer proposition is a hook, a quick fix. History is replaced with stoic insights, sociology replaced with pop psychology, literature replaced with action films, deep critique replaced with shallow philosophy quotes. This frame of authentic knowledge being found within, through the red pill, contains a fundamental error about how knowledge is formed. Thinking through this error can help us think about how we should respond to the manosphere. Knowledge is never immediate, but always mediated. It runs through different points, like a river, never coming from a single source, but always from multiple entry points. To understand a river, say, we have to look to physics, geology, its tributaries, weather cycles, and so on. There are many disciplines, many points of view, not any supposed single source. Any understanding of the concept of a river requires an engagement with the wider idea of nature, a totality itself. In fact, immediate knowledge or supposedly authentic identity is often mistaken. Immediate, direct experience tells us that the sun revolves around the earth or that sticks bend in water. Immediate direct historical evidence from, for example, a soldier during a war is powerful, but tells us nothing of the wider war, the reasons, the politics, the campaign, the troop movements, the maps, memory and the senses can also be faulty. Trauma can affect how we think, our personalities, our psychologies, the present moment can always affect how we think, change how we think. Several philosophers have argued against thinkers like Descartes, Kant and Fichte that knowledge can be based on immediate and authentic first-person principles. The German philosopher Georg Friedrich Hegel, for example, very influentially argued that all knowledge is mediated, that the whole is more important than the individual parts. What does this mean? Well, it's impossible to understand any concept without going outside of it to the whole. It's impossible to understand men without considering the relationship to women, and as such the concept of human, and then the human's wider relationship to its environment and nature. It's impossible to understand the concept of timber without the concept of tree, landscape, water and oxygen. Because human action is social, any choice of what any individual should do jumps outside of the individual and has to consider the wider whole. How others will react, what the law is say, what friends will think or colleagues, what the science says. In short, all action is inter-subjective. Because there's always another person to limit what we say, to prod, to argue, another subjectivity becomes part of ours. Even if we ignore them, move away, there's still a space, the where they are, that becomes part of our individual subjective mental map. Philosopher Terry Pinkard puts it like this, self-legislation must start from somewhere in particular, from an involvement in some kind of pre-reflective, pre-deliberative context of rules and principles that we have not determined for ourselves and thus 
from some other legislation that has been imposed on the agent from outside the agent's own activities. Thinking involves going outside of yourself. If you live egotistically, as Andrew Tate does, believing in the sheer power of self-confidence and self-will, you fail to incorporate the ideas, the social rules and influence of others into your map for acting. You can act as if your realm of authentic and red-pilled existence is my truth, say, but you're shutting yourself down from other people's modes of living, thinking, acting, and because of this, you're going to inevitably become a less successful actor in the world. This is why empathy is one of our most powerful human tools. In attempting to see something from another's point of view, it's not just that you're being altruistic or thoughtful or benevolent or considerate, it's that you're widening your own knowledge, picking up different ways of seeing, talking in multiple personal languages, thinking about what the other would do and why. The wider you cast your net of understanding, the more you touch the most powerful of things. The universal, the perspective of infinity, the person who can call upon and has a sense of the universal inevitably over the long term becomes the most influential. The philosopher Frederick Schelling, in responding to Fichte's all-powerful I, said, how can it be the case that all knowledge starts from an I when there must be some kind of pre-established harmony, a common world of some kind, to even communicate to in the first place at all? Otherwise, he says, quote, those who intuited utterly different worlds would have absolutely nothing in common and no point of contact at which they could come together. With the hyper-personalised experience we get from the internet, conspiracy theories become more common precisely because the I thinks it can always dispute the common world by choosing its own evidence, by putting itself and its own experience on a pedestal. But this is a mistake. As Philip K. Dick said, Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Freedom, being more free, doesn't come from believing and tapping into some inner wisdom, but instead comes from without, comes from our institutions and historical contexts, our bodies of knowledge, our collective responsibilities, how others respond to you and so on. It's not the hit workout and the self-help book that sets you free. It's our collective landscape. You guys have no idea because you're in a bubble and we all sit out here looking at Which is again why red pill ideology lines up with libertarianism. People like Jordan Peterson have to believe that freedom to be masculine, for example, comes from timeless individual freedoms rather than an idea of freedom that's evolved and changed over time and will continue to evolve and change. Institutions, feminism, cultural Marxists, regulations are all criticised based on how much they supposedly restrict that innate, natural and timeless individuality. But institutions, whether the media, governments, churches, families, schools, friendship circles, colleagues, any normative body of knowledge about how to act and what to do, this is the raw material from which individuals are formed, from which individuality springs forth. This is the common world, to use Schelling's terminology, that should be the object of any analysis. It's there, in that common world, that our intersubjectivity plays out. In a culture that doesn't believe this, history doesn't matter because we have the supposed eternal truths of something like evolutionary psychology. Sociological change doesn't matter because there's no such thing as society, in Margaret Thatcher's words. Institutions are only important to the extent to which they align with my truth, my desire to do what I want to do. There's a turning inward rather than an acknowledgement that all experience is mediated, that we all have to engage, interact with each other 
than the outside world. In this way of thinking, there's only the immediate desire, the individual feeling, the present moment. What this really amounts to is stop thinking, renounce analysis and reflection. Things won't change. In this video, I wanted to explore some of the philosophy that might help explain that red pill matrix triad. For me, as much as for you, it helps to lay a foundation like this, a structure to further explore. But any analysis needs to think about exactly why men get pulled into this rabbit hole in the first place. Ben Rich and Eve Bijalka write in a conversation article that for many young men, their introduction to the manosphere begins not with hatred of women, but with a desire to dispel uncertainty about how the world around them works and crucially, how relationships work. They continue that the foundations of the manosphere may not strictly center on misogyny as is popularly imagined, but in young men's search for connection truth, control and community at a time when all are increasingly ill-defined. And the sociologist David Morgan has argued that as the world has shifted from brawn to brains, many men have fallen behind. Boys don't do as well as girls at school, wages have stagnated for 50 years, we're staring at screens all day and presented with the highly unequal social space and unrealistic models of what success looks like. Morgan argues that some men, devoid of the status they think they used to have, find themselves in a position of, quote, cultural redundancy. But instead of thinking through change, the conservative tendency is to blame change. If feminism, cultural Marxism and conspiracies are the problem, then all you have to do is look within to a timeless kernel of supposed masculinity to find the solution. In taking the red pill and seeing a truth that cuts itself off from the wider matrix of belief, you end up stubbornly cutting yourself off from other groups, other ideas, other people, limiting yourself and what you can do with your life. To be honest, this is a topic I need to return to because I was reading Victor and Schelling and Hegel and I thought, oh, I can make a little video about some of the philosophical ideas and how they relate to being red-pilled. And to be honest, I've now gotten ahead of myself. So I've got a long reading list to get through. Um, I'll leave a link uh, in the bibliography and you can maybe join me and maybe we'll discuss in the Discord. And I'll return to this topic from a different angle with this philosophical foundation at a later point because the intersection of masculinity, conservatism, identity politics, and people like Tate and Peterson, how it all seems to mesh together, clearly tells us something important about our present moment. So in conclusion, I'll try and keep it simple, because I think the message from what we've just looked at here is that the red pill doesn't exist. It itself is an ideology, a mythology, a matrix of beliefs, because there's no escaping the social common world and reverting to some authentic, rational notion of what masculinity or anything else is. If you think you can find the key to say relationship success in a forum or a method or a formula, there is none. Intersubjectivity is more important than you. Thank you to all of these incredible Patreon supporters. These videos take a long time to research, write and make. I do a lot of reading. They're always sourced and there's a bibliography in the description below. I've written something short on why I think this kind of well-researched, long-form content is worth supporting. It's through the link below too. If you agree, then you can support then and now by pledging anything from a single dollar per month and get your name in credits, access to scripts early and become a member of the Discord server. If you can't do that, I know everyone says this this, but please do subscribe, hit the bell, like, leave a comment. These things help with the algorithm so, so much. I'm also trying out a newsletter. I'm going to distill and summarize each video into a quick, easily digestible email for those who don't have time or want to recap, along with some related insights. Sign up below. As always, more than anything, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.